Hey guys and welcome back to Yu-Gi-Oh! Everything! My name is Pete and welcome back to the channel with a little segment that we like to call Legacy Reviews. If you've not been by the channel before or you've never seen this segment, welcome. Uh, this is a segment where I break down the original trilogy, the first three Yu-Gi-Oh! shows in order, obviously being Dual Monsters, GX, and 5Ds, and I give my thoughts and kind of analysis and discuss with you guys down below in the comments. I can do that because I have never seen the shows before. I have no idea what is going to happen. And so hopefully it's a fresh perspective for you guys when you hear these reviews. And it's a fun time for me to watch them and uh, discuss and do these reviews with you guys. With that being said, and all that out of the way, we're going to jump into the first part of this review, which is Duel Monsters episode 15 that we're doing today. So I'll be right back. All right, guys, welcome back to the Duel Monster side. Kicking us off here, this is episode 15, Cut Through the Darkness, Swords of Revealing Light. This is the second parter of the two-part duel we've had between Yugi and Player Killer. Uh, and, it, you know, it was a pretty decent episode. You know, this kind of, like, two-episode arc wasn't really anything crazy. It's kind of the standard that we've been going through here in Duelist Kingdom where you have some kind of bounty hunter type kind of character, one of these player killer like characters um, trying to take out Yugi and the gang and usually literally kill them if not get them to lose and kick them off the island and steal all uh, kind of of their duel chips so they can't get to the castle. Uh, but this episode, I think, was more interesting because it, as, as the characters, the side characters, in my particularly, point out, it showcases the side of Yugi where he's using kind of his trash talk and kind of his mental and emotional capabilities more than his dueling skills. And that's not to say that his dueling skills were, were lacking in this episode. They clearly were not. But the ability for him to use his trash talk to kind of keep his opponent completely off balance I thought was a really smart way to do this episode and, and that allowed him to use his trump cards and use his trump strategy um, to overwhelm as they say his opponent and player killer I thought that was really really smart him to continually call him a coward throughout the duel get him to make kind of silly moves where yes I, I'm getting used to it I've listened to you guys I've listened to Dylan of the, of the kind of Duelist Kingdom logic um, where things kind of don't make sense especially when I'm watching the other two shows and sevens simultaneously you're used to the game working in certain ways you have to understand that you know the game the game wasn't really there wasn't really a rule book on how any of this worked when they had these episodes premiering. So when when you have the strategy of him putting all his monsters in defense position and he kind of has them underneath his castle and he has this basically impenetrable wall with that light card that he uses that upped all the defense points and creates a shield around it and all that stuff. None of that I don't think would actually happen in the game. And you could correct me if I'm wrong down below, obviously, as you guys always educate me because um, I'm not really into the TCG side of it, but I feel like that's not something that normally happens uh, in a lot of these regular duels, and you see that a lot here. But that being said, in the, the logic and the universe of the show here in Duel Monsters, I really like that he was able to you know keep saying to him, hey, hey, big guy, that was really his, his thing. That and Coward were the two big things that he kept um, kind of piercing into Player Killer and allowing him to almost retreat into him himself which we, we see and i'll talk about that a little bit but doubt every move that he made player killer does he doubted every move because yugi kept him that off balance and it was it had me wondering throughout the episode i was just like hey is yugi is he actually have a plan here or is it really just trash talk to have kind of player killer um, really destroy himself and kind of, you know, eat away at himself and his cards and his monsters, and he will end up making kind of the final blow. He'll weaken himself enough where maybe Yuki could strike. Or is Yugi this confident and he really knows what he's doing? And I think it ended up being a mix of both. Um, that he, he had the ability ready. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He claims that he knew he was going to do that wall with the castle the entire time, and that's why he set up the, hey, you're going to lose in four turns. And then you have that weird graphic throughout it when it goes to three turns and two turns where you have the numbers kind of float on the screen there. It, it just felt, for me, it felt a little out of place so far with Duel Monsters and Yukio has been. I thought that was an 
an interesting animation choice and like writing choice to have that actually visualized on the screen. I didn't know if I was a, a huge fan of that, and I don't think I am, but hey, hey you know, a little nitpick, it is what it is. Um, but what I did like in this episode as well is a lot of times, especially with what I would assume is in a one off character, you know, in these two episodes here of Player Killer, is you actually get the insight into him and what he's thinking and kind of his you know thoughts going forward on how to proceed with the duel and his doubts and and him wondering what yugi's gonna do next that's always a classic protagonist or whoever kind of our hero character is you usually see what they're thinking you never see what the villainous character especially a probably one-off character is thinking and i thought that was an interesting perspective because it played on the idea of the shadows that he he implemented and you know swords of revealing light uh, when he when he put that up, Yugi it made the whole field visible, but it still was the idea of not knowing what your opponent is going to do, and the game kind of shifted on its head where Yugi in the previous episode could not see because of the shadow effect of the castle. He couldn't see the literal monsters that were on Player Killer's side of the field. Well, now it was the opposite, that even though Player Killer can see Yugi's monsters, he was kind of in the shadows of having literally no idea what to expect from his opponent and and they say a couple lines of that in the episode as well so you know it's not like i'm saying anything you guys wouldn't pick out but i thought that was a really interesting theme um throughout the episode and the swords of revealing light was really cool i like that you can't attack for three turns even with you know yellow luster shield you know combined with the castle everyone's thinking it's bad and yugi staying you know or that other version of yugi staying calm cool collected i really thought was um was great about halfway through the episode, I know we, we added this stipulation in last episode that, like, Yugi could literally die and he's shackled by his ankles and all that, but to kind of have Player Killer get so frustrated that he launches fire cannons at him to l literally try to kill Yugi in the middle of the match is, is not only poor sportsmanship, but I just, like, I, I think sometimes, like, hey, this is a Yu-Gi-Oh! show, but also murder, you know, like, there's literally murder, like, he could have headshotted him right in the middle of the match in front of everyone, and how would that have played out, like, if Yugi actually died? Because we see that Pegasus wants Yugi to come to the castle, he wants to duel Yugi, whether it's revenge, he has some kind of other, I imagine he has some kind of other motivation. He wants that Millennium Puzzle from Yugi, and yes, he could rip it off his dead body if he didn't have a head on, but I think Pegasus is more about actually facing him. We've seen that. So, would he punish Player Killer to, like, if he killed Yugi? Because he's the one that, you know, employed him. So he wants to slow down Yugi, or maybe he wanted to really take out other powerful characters on the on the island like Mai, and then kind of Yugi with his hero stance kind of stepped in there and was just trying to do the right thing. So I, I wonder how that would have played out. I wish it was like an alternate like short where Yugi dies there, and then we kind of we see how Pegasus reacts to what happens. I, I just thought that was kind of my funny imagination uh, to wonder about that. The duel happens. Yugi wins, gets the castle to fall on because he knocks off the levitation ring, and so he says that the you know um, the swords of revealing light were the only thing actually holding up the castle. Once that happened, you know when he used the Gaia Knight that he used with polymerization combined with the cursed dragon, and it falls down there. And I thought it was also interesting that is this like a rule at this point where because I know there's not really any rules, but player killer shouts for his monsters to flee and then they couldn't flee because of the yellow luster shield but if that wasn't there could the monsters actually have had their own autonomy and listened to their master there player killer and ran and avoided the attack because i feel like that doesn't really work with the rules of the game so i'm, I'm a little bit confused but i guess i guess i guess i have to forgive those things as, as I, I said earlier just because that's just duelist kingdom and then at the end kind of what you expected um, from a character like Player Killer. He still tries to kill Yugi. Yugi, I guess, uses the Millennium Puzzle to not only shield himself, but he delivers the Mind Crush. And I thought it was also interesting, that's kind of becoming my keyword of this review, where he knows Player Killer what was about to happen because he shouts for him to don't, don't do it, and then just disappears. And we don't see Player Killer's body. 
and we don't see him on the ground, you know, all messed up like we've seen other opponents from the Mind Crush. He just kind of disappears out of the episode, and we'll probably never see him again. Uh, so I, th I thought that was weird. And then there was an interesting line at the end where I believe it was Genochi or Honda says, I think the flames destroyed the 3D virtual system when they were talking about the blinding light. No, that was Yugi's Millennium Puzzle and his ability, and he knows it. Uh, and I thought that was really funny. And then at the end, you have him being the noble person. He offers to give Mai back the chips. Jonochi very smartly says, oh, I'll just take them. And for a second, I thought, hey, is Jonochi really going to be a piece of crap right here? But no, he was kind of goading Mai into taking the chips. And Mai says, hey, you know, when I'm worthy enough because I'm in your debt to beat you and, and even go against you fair and square, I will. And I think Anzu and I think the rest of the group have more of a respect for Mai. And I'm interested to see where that character goes that seemed very flat when we were on the boat coming to the island and now seems to be a way more developed character over these last few episodes. But guys, that's kind of my thoughts here on Duel Monsters episode 15 um, about you know, Swords of Revealing Light, Cut Through the Dark and Swords of Revealing Light. Let me know what you thought in the comments below about that and uh, where the story you think is going forward. Obviously, as I always say, at every part of these reviews, in case you, you're skipping around in timestamps and at the beginning and end, please no spoilers because it just makes the reviews that much better, hopefully, for you guys. I'm going to jump over to GX, so I'll be right back. All right, guys, welcome back to the GX side of the review. This is episode 15 titled The Dual Tennis of Youth, and this is just a... Uh another one of those wacky kind of GX episodes here that we're getting, uh, I mean, for the entire show, but this is what people say uh, kind of happens early on in GX, kind of gotten used to the style of this show, uh, and, I, and I still I still like it, but I am waiting kind of for the plot to pick up a little bit more, so there's not much to cover really in this review of episode 15. I guess we could say this is a, um, or I could say this is a near and dear episode to, you know, my heart and, and Dylan and Calibros alike, because we also used to play back in the day, hey, uh, makes me sound so old, we used to play back in the day some uh, varsity tennis, and uh, now we have an entire episode about tennis, we had, you know, little snippets of baseball in the previous uh, episode, what was last, two, two, three episodes ago, and now we get this one, so really the episode starts off um, with Judai doing kind of what he doesn't like doing which i mean honestly he doesn't like doing anything for the most part besides hanging out with his friends and dueling that that's pretty much judai's personality so far but even though we have seen he has been um decently athletic as the show has um progressed and has it started off here through the first 15 episodes but he's playing tennis some hijinks happen where you know he kind of goes up for an overhead he misses it terribly. It's going to hit Asuka in the face. And this uh, guy that we'll call President Pepe, as they call him throughout the episode, you know, his, his father's a big deal in some kind of car dealership motors or whatever. He's the president of the tennis duel club, the tennis club. And um, he kind of saves Asuka. And at first, he's really playing it cool, the president is. And then when he sees it's Asuka, you know, the legendary of obelisk blue Asuka, you know, and how gorgeous he sees her to be, he kind of gets flustered and a little bit off his game, even though Asuka's friends think he is very attractive. Um, when all of this happens, he redirects the ball, um, the tennis ball, to hit, <laughs> of course, Kronos right in the eye, which is just the hijinks so far in the show that Kronos is always in some way shape or form he got hit with the in the face with the baseball he's been humiliated you know in front of the entire school by judai and now he's hit in the face by a tennis ball and so he always takes that out on the dropout boys he calls judai even though the you know the nurse there the other instructor was like hey it wasn't he didn't do this deliberately and it wasn't even it wasn't even him who hit you and he still has to pay the price so the price he pays is basically just having to play with the president and really just having to rally 50 balls, 100 balls, whatever it is, and, and really wear him out physically and kind of drain him of all his stamina as a punishment. As he says, you know, you, you can't just forgive him because that would be a half measure and he makes a terrible pun with that. Uh, and then when Asuka comes to the court, she kind of just steps on and ignores the president and goes right to Judai. And we've seen this relationship that they've been building so far in the show where she's she still looks down on Judai, I think, as, a, as you know, Cypher read, but also thinks he's an idiot. I mean, it outright says that in this episode. But she respects him in his ability to communicate with people and how personable he can be, but also his dueling skills are 
um, have been pretty well demonstrated so far through the show. And when she comes over to talk about a spotting of Manjome, that little innocent conversation that could be about a serious topic really pisses the, the president of the tennis club off. He takes it as the two of them are romantically involved in some way. And since he has a crush on her, he challenges Judai to a duel and basically <laughs> gives these outrageous, this outrageous um, kind of reward that whoever wins is going to be Asuka's fiance, which she in no way, shape, or form agreed to whatsoever. It's absolutely ridiculous, but I guess that's kind of how um jealous he was and wanted to be so controlling and also so in love he was and so throughout the episode you get a lot of interesting i think like cool little animations there's the one shot where like he has like his eyes turn red and his whole body is supposed to be surrounded by fire because that's how aggravated and you know enraged with jealousy is in those moments so i like those little anime um touches in, in many shows and in, in particularly here in, in the zukio trilogy that we have been covering when they do those uh, kind of little outrageous, little cartoony, but hijinks. But they work for the story and really show the expression of what the inner feelings of those characters are. The duel itself wasn't really that interesting, to be honest. I mean, he, Judai, I think, and the rest of the characters in this episode, with, with show watching along with Asuka's crew, um, were very meta. They were very self-aware of what was going on uh, and really stating it to the audience in this episode. And one of the lines Judai says, Judai says, um, in this, as he said, oh, that's pretty much all you do, huh? In, in reference to President Pepe's kind of dueling style, where he just has all these tennis-themed kind of cards, and he's always trying to attack directly with usually a spell card to Judai. He's not really, he only really brings out one major, the big server, was really his only major monster that happened on the field. Uh, the duel goes on, you know, they both get down to a thousand life points, which at first worked in you know, the president's favor, and then Judai is able to turn around the duel, which is not really surprising whatsoever. And you have all your little te tennis references of, of deuces and serving and aces, and you have your overheads and who's has advantage here and advantage there, you know, advantage in, advantage out, uh, when you usually have a deuce when you're 40-40 in a game. Even when the president is up, he says 15 love, 30 love. So, so they definitely show kind of their love for tennis in the in this episode, which is something I always greatly appreciate seeing kind of an underrated sport in tennis in the medium. Judai ends up winning the duel where he's able to use triple feather shot, which was kind of worked out because he got depolymerization, so he got three monsters onto the field, and that allowed him to get around uh, the president's kind of deuce spell card, which was only allowing him to attack once with one monster. He got around that, was able to destroy Big Server, and then was able to destroy the president. An advantage goes to Judai. And it all kind of stemmed from and backfired from the president earlier when he allowed, um, kind of on his like gamble technique that he was using, Judai to draw a card, and that ended up being the card uh, that Judai drew and ended up being the president's downfall. So it kind of ends... The president, you know, kind of runs away with his tail between his legs and starts crying, which was not a good look for an obelisk blue or a duelist or any hopes of looking good in front of Asuka or Judai for that matter. Uh, it was kind of pathetic. And then Judai asks the very dumb question of what a fiance is. He has no idea. And Asuka just tells him he's an idiot. And then it comes kind of this last shot. I saw some people after I watched the episode agreed in the comments here on Crunchyroll that like the president is over the cliffside with the sunset and he's screaming about he's hate dueling and you know he's crying now and he seems like he's a broken person and a broken man. There was a brief second where I was like, is this show gonna go there and this man's literally gonna jump off the cliff and, you know, take his own life for losing one duel? But thankfully, thankfully did not go that dark. Um, that would have been really twisted, especially 15 episodes in. But yeah, guys, that's that's pretty much uh, it for GX this week. I'm gonna finish up with the 5D side of the review, so I'll be right back. All right, guys, and welcome back to the final part of the review, the 5Ds part, episode 15, and this is a mouthful. Duel of Fortune Cup begins attack from the sky, flying fortress Skyfire. I feel like in 5Ds, these names, as I said before, really are getting longer and longer, and it, it's, it's kind of getting out of hand, honestly, at this point. But a, a really good episode. We kind of start what is something that, you know, uh, me and the crew over at Yukio Everything have been clamoring for in, you know, the current shows, whether it was Reigns 
or now sevens to have an actual tournament arc you know like some kind of cup going on and that's exactly what we are getting here uh in 5ds as i am watching and am reviewing it for all of you so you know kind of starts off where you know rex god when we know he's put together everything here we we know that uh you know lua was gonna um kind of go in the place of his sister luca even though she's the one that technically got invited and we'll talk more about that in a second but you know the king was he starts off the episode he's you know extravagant as always and and who's going to challenge him and we see that eight people are the ones who end up um kind of joining the tournament uh lua being the only one who's actually not supposed to be there he kind of had a fun little moment there it was it's fun pairing him pairing him with um you say of how serious you say is of like he's wearing makeup lua and then <laughs> you say just going yeah you you really you really shouldn't do that anymore i guess and you know outright saying that he doesn't really look good with it but we have this man bomer um who becomes the uh one that lua ends up dueling later in the episode as they get selected for the first duel and i actually thought because the whole crowd is reacting at the beginning of the episode about you say's mark and you know we know how they look down on people of satellite especially in neo domino city and for him to actually come out and say that there's nothing to be ashamed of that and, and talk about equality, it probably in the end was just all for show because he, he's clearly working with Rex Godwin. But in that moment, I really thought he was going to trash you, say, and actually supporting him and talking about equality and having a moving speech was really fan, uh, kind of moving and fantastic moment that I thought that really the show just continues to do a great job of. It's just unfortunate that it was more than likely clearly all for show and all part of Godwin's plan, as I feel like everything is. Um, we see that the Black Rose Witch from last episode is also seemingly one of the contestants um, there as well as part of this uh, Fortune Cup arc. Not, no one else that I recognize so far but try, you know, besides her and obviously Yusei and Lua. But we get into the episode and it... You get some shots where that you have that mad scientist uh, that is working for Godwin, and they seem to be wanting to create this momentum, you know, event here, which, I mean, kind of almost destroyed the city last time when Jack and Yusei went against each other. It wasn't really a good idea, uh, but they, they are so hung up on this idea and desperate almost in some ways to kind of replicate these effects and have you know figure out who the signers are and and see who you know how to bring out these events and this incredible energy and power because you know they're part of this cult and all these other things that godwin is a part of and that his crew is a part of but the mad scientist actually has like a detecting uh device for who is going to be a signer so that is pretty advanced tech that i was not expecting to be the case and they right away they quickly realize that not only there's the joke of the episode there even with bomer that like you could see it, it is not a girl participating it is it is a young boy and not a young girl but they immediately identify as the episode goes on that there's something going on in the crowd and then they pinpoint it's luca who is actually the one that was supposed to be invited as they know because they set this up all in motion because they've investigated her and she is the signer, she's one with power, and when they turn up the device to kind of, I guess, get a broader range um, to search throughout the stadium, it actually hurts Luca's head. And there's some, some kind of cloudiness thoughts going on there. So that's gonna be very interesting to kind of examine what exactly that means. Clearly she's probably a signer and they are probably correct, but why? Does she react that way? Why do they get the feelings that way? Is it just an overwhelming sense of power? Does the, the machine hurt them? Is it an ability to be able to cloud their thoughts and then later Godwin can control them almost like a robot or a zombie? That's a fascinating thing going forward. Uh, but we get to the duel itself and you know, I, I actually forgot that uh, Lua had the Morphtronics for when he went against Yusei kind of like in the... Um, little house you know the very rich house that him and uh luca were living in it's not it's not my favorite deck to be completely honest uh but he uses it to the best of his ability he's just clearly not at a significant of a threat of a dueling level but he is learning and you're seeing that progression now from the first duel to the second duel i think there's going to be a nice arc for this character um going forward clearly especially that he's prominent as well as luca in the opening but bomer 
takes advantage of kind of like a, a, a summoner deck where you could have like summoner reactors that block off when a monster is summoned, when you use a trap card or a spell card. So the three main things, really your, your three moves in a duel are completely blocked and and if you use it you take 800 points of damage so it's a really strapping um like it straps your opponent it's a really highly effective way to duel and um it's cutthroat i would say definitely something that lua is is not prepared for as you say says as well and and clearly the crowd um, of Luca watching on and everyone else and Grandpa, they could see that Lua is easily becoming overwhelmed as the duel continues. But he puts up his best effort, and Bomer, uh, we see very early on that he clearly is a part of Godwin's team because he's been instructed to kind of anger and get to what he thought was supposed to be Luca, try to get her, but it ends up being Lua, obviously kind of fired up in the moment and that's supposed to bring out whatever this the signer energy or, or whatever they're looking for that is supposed to bring it out when they kind of get pumped up and they're really giving it their all and that's what Bomer's doing is just with his words and with his actual actions in the dueling there he's just taking shot after shot after shot and he's respecting Lua in some ways but is still doing his job um, quite effectively I would say. So Lua gets Gadget Cannon, uh, Gadget and Cannon on the field at the end of it, had 2,900 attack points, he was able to boost it up. He looked like he was doing a good job there to maybe defeat Bomer, and then Bomer was able to block it. He summons his Flying Fortress Skyfire, which was the kind of the be-all, end-all, has 3,000 attack. It's a really actually cool animation scene, I believe, and kind of Bomer gives me a little bit of vibes of Bowman. I don't know if anyone else got that in some similar ways from look to the way he talks, and even in some ways that he duels, even though I know they're completely different decks. Uh, and then completely in, in a one-episode duel, I thought it would actually be longer, completely nullifies Gadget and Cannon, completely wipes it off the field, and then uh, finishes Lua off, and, and that is the end of that. And then you see him meet up at the end uh, with Godwin and his crew. They identify Luca is the girl that they are looking for, uh, and that is the end of the episode. So guys, that wraps up the 5D side of the review here, episode 15, and that wraps up this episode of Legacy Reviews. Thank you so much if you listened um, this far, if you only want to go to one specific show, the timestamps will always be down below in the description. As always, like the video, subscribe to the channel, stay here for more content, more podcasts, more great videos uh, that Dylan and, uh, and his illustrious crew that I'm part of as well are producing for you lovely people out there. And uh, until next Legacy Review, thanks for watching.